Hi there to all the folks joining us. We are a couple minutes out from the start of the event and we'll give it just another couple minutes to get some more folks joined on here. Thanks again for everyone who is joining us tonight. about another minute and then we're going to get started folks. All right, folks, we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to all the folks who joined us a little early as we got all of our tech ready. This is the 37th District Town Hall, and we are so excited to have you join us tonight to hear from your state legislators, Senator Rebecca Saldana, Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos, and Representative Kirsten harris Talley. And tonight, our focus is on what is happening in the 2022 legislative session that began on January 10th and is going to end on March 10th. So a couple logistical things. Um, a lot of the questions that we've received tonight came into us submitted in advance in the survey, um, or when you registered, you could submit a question. If you're joining us live on Zoom, you can also use the Q&A button at the bottom to submit questions and we'll make sure that we get to as many as we can, and we're gonna try and alternate between questions submitted in advance and live questions coming through us right now. So to get us started, uh, we'll start with some brief opening remarks from our lawmakers. Senator Saldana, can you start us off with that? Great, thank you so much, Emily. And thank you to everyone that is joining us today. I really appreciate you taking time on a Monday and to get our update and for us to give it a chance to hear from you. As um, everyone knows, or I won't assume that everyone knows, we're at a point where most of the policy uh, bills from the Senate have made it over to the House or have not. Um, and where we are now in committee hearing um, House bills that um, uh, on, on different policies. So the big thing that happened today for me is our transportation committee heard our supplemental budget as well as the move ahead Washington, which is a 16 year um, investment and really trying to turn the ship 
in terms of how we think about transportation investments for it will have historic investments um, on preservation and maintenance, but also with active transportation and really making sure that we're centering equity in terms of higher, represent, higher um, investments in um, workforce development for both maritime as well as construction, investments in pre-apprenticeship and um, making sure that we are doing our investments in our black and um, people of color um, contractors. It's also about making sure that we prioritize safety, including uh, and making sure that we're giving to people real choices. Um, one really exciting part of this policy is that um, we have new investments in operating for, trans for public transit grants that will include um, policy to allow youth under 18 to ride free from ferries to sound transit to um, their local buses. Um, so I'll just, I'll say that's been a big part of what I've been working on this session is transportation, but I also serve on labor, commerce, and tribal affairs where we're hearing um, good worker protection legislation, as well as um, um, human services rehabilitation and re-entry, um, looking at ways that we can um, remove barriers for young people and for communities that have been disproportionately impacted. With that, I will pass it on um, to um, Emily, does it matter? I'll, I'll pass it on to Representative Santos um, if that works. Terrific. Thank you, Senator Saldana. And uh, thank you, 37th District Representatives, for joining us this evening. Before I uh, speak about uh, my role and my work, I uh, especially want to welcome our, our interpreters, uh, both our ASL interpreters, as well as our foreign language interpreters. We have Chinese uh, speaking um, interpreters with us this evening, and uh, we want to make sure that everyone who is joining us uh, feels welcome because after all, the 37th legislative district has long been the most diverse legislative district in the state. It is a fact that I take great pride in. My name is Sharon Tomiko Santos. I am proud to have served this community for the past 24 years in the House of Representatives. I'm proud not only because we have the most diverse legislative district, although it has changed quite a bit since the last census, um, but also because this is the district in which I was raised. And so these communities of the 37th district are my childhood playground. And I have uh, very fond memories of the people and the institutions um, and the places that have figured prominently in my life um, throughout. Uh, I currently serve on three committees. I serve on consumer protection and business, formerly known as the Financial Institutions and Insurance Committee. So we deal in that committee with, of course, banking uh, and other types of uh, financial products, uh, such as mortgages. So we manage mortgage brokers as well. I serve on uh, the Capital Budget Committee um, and I'd like to talk more about um, the exciting news that comes from our capital budget uh, committee as well, if people are interested. And finally, I chair the uh, House Education Committee, which in the House of Representatives has jurisdiction over K-12. We have separate committees. In fact, uh, my House seatmate, uh, uh, Representative Harris Talley, I'm sure we'll be talking about her committees as well. Uh, early learning falls to one of her uh, committees of jurisdiction and um, uh, higher education. So those are all separate ideal in the K-12 world. I want to spend just a moment or two talking about my priorities this year. Um, they really center on two primary ideas. One is um, recovery and the other is rebuilding. And those are two separate thoughts. Um, in the area of education, um, trying to ensure that our students are in a good place to be educated. Um, what that means is that they have to be supported in their mental health 
That is a big issue. We have never seen such an increase in suicidal ideation and actual suicidal completion in multiple generations. So mental health services and supports for our students, as well as other types of student supports are going to be very important because when the brain is uh, working under stress and trauma, it cannot learn. So that's the first order of business. In addition, you probably know because uh, COVID has effectively shut down our schools, um, off and on this year, but all throughout last year, um, the uh, and now to have uh, in-person learning, we have to have strong protocols in place that protect our students as well as our staff. Unfortunately, uh, at the same time, we've had an acute shortage in our staffing that is exacerbated by the need for strong um, uh, quarantine and um, uh, isolation um, protocols. So we've had to try and increase the number of staff uh, that are available in our schools. And then finally, um, in order to have in-person learning, you know, we have to have the lights on, we have to have the heat on. And unfortunately, the way our budget works, we fund our schools based on seat time. And if you don't have the same number of students who are in their seats this year or last year compared to 2019, 2020, what that means is our school districts and our schools have faced a uh, budget uh, shortfall related to declining enrollment. So we're trying to find ways to stabilize our schools because it costs the same whether you have 25 students in a classroom or one student in a classroom, you still need to pay for the lights, you still need to pay for the heat and that's not really different. The other two priorities I'll just touch on quickly um, are very similar and uh, actually uh, mutually dependent. One is around community preservation. We have some of the most historic communities in our district. Again, I'm very proud that we collectively, uh, Senator Saldana, Representative Harris Talley, and I represent the historic Pioneer Square, the historic Chinatown International District, and the historic uh, Central District, which was um, the place where our African American uh, communities flourished uh, after the Second World War. Um, we have had a history of gentrification. Uh, we have had uh, that has um, challenged uh, the history and the character of these places. Uh, we need to instead preserve these places and their character and their history. We also need to ensure the safety of those who live there. I think of what our, our international district has gone through over the last two years with rising Asian hate, uh, with um, the, uh, uh, the um, vandalism that has occurred uh, in the international district storefronts. Um, and we need to make sure that we are setting a, a protective um, dome over our communities with preservation in mind. And finally, the community development through supporting our small businesses and their recovery, because when language becomes a barrier, when culture becomes a barrier, it's those communities that did not get to share in the resources that were delivered by the federal government last year when we had the emergency funds available for the American Recovery Act. Um, that did not seep out to all Americans. And so we want to make sure that we're doing a better job of that. And I think we have uh, in this legislative session. With that, I am going to turn it over to my seatmate, the wonderful Representative Kirsten harris Talley. Thank you so much. And it's always wonderful to be here with neighbors online. I am Representative Kirsten Harris Talley, she, her, and have the honor of serving alongside Senator Saldana and Representative Santos and, and the newest 
addition to our all woman of color delegation for the 37th, which I think speaks volumes for the history of this district and the calling of the moment. I have the honor of serving on three committees. The Finance Committee, where we have considerations of equitable tax policy and impacts on revenue for our budget. I also serve on the Environment and Energy Committee with priorities for how we will address our climate crisis and build resilience in the face of it, a huge issue for a district like ours that's been so disproportionately impacted by a whole number of intersectional issues in regards to that for generations. Mm -hmm. And then I also serve as vice chair of the Children, Youth and Families Committee. I describe that committee as the counterpart to our education committee that Chair Santos chairs and that anything else that impacts young people in our state that is not addressed in that committee is addressed in our Children, Youth and Families Committee. And as the only elected abolitionist, I have a particular concentration on our juvenile justice systems as we continue to look for alternatives to incarcerating and caging children in the state. So we have a lot still to do, but have done a tremendous amount of work this year. This is my first short session, and I thought it went quick when I was an advocate. It feels like lightning as a legislator. Um, and as my colleagues noted, we're at a very pivotal moment for two reasons. One, the Chamber of Origins, where each of us started our work in committee, stewarding good policy and trying to block bad policy. All that good policy we've passed is now in the other chamber for our other colleague counterparts to consider. But today also marked the day that both chambers have laid bare our proposals for the budget. So we will also start between our chambers negotiating where our budget, a moral document where we will put our resources, the tax dollars of this state to serve you, our neighbors. So we are having a conversation with you at a very pivotal moment in this legislative session. I do want to highlight a few of the policies that I have championed that I wanna start by saying are led first and foremost by community. And that is something I love about being a part of this delegation. All three of us center community and how we develop and steward policy. And that is not the norm I will say amongst our other colleagues, but I know it's a norm here amongst these colleagues in the 37th. And it is in part because of what you all hold us accountable to. So I had the pleasure of sponsoring this year the Doulas for All policy that was started by the Doulas for All Coalition and coordinated by the Surge Reproductive Justice Organization that is also here in the heart of the 37th district. I'm particularly excited about this policy because it's work led by Black, Brown, and Indigenous doulas who are non-medical birth assistants who have been in our communities for generations, making sure that we have healthy birth outcomes. And with this policy now in the Senate, hopefully on the floor soon, this will have for the first time a state certification so that we can have Medicaid coverage for this literally life-saving service that is provided by so many in our state. I also introduced the end parent pay policy for the House Companion, House Bill 2050, which will end a practice that we've had in Washington state since 1977, that when we incarcerate young people in the state, we also charge their families for that incarceration, extending that punishment and putting undue burden on families already deeply impacted in our communities. I'm excited to hopefully see an end to that 45 year practice if we get that policy over the finish line and signed by the governor. And then I also introduced a policy to extend diversion options for, for young people. Diversion is an alternative to incarceration so that when our young people make a mistake and find themselves wrapped up with law enforcement, that they can find options of diversion where they give service directly back to community as they make amends. It's a, a system and a way of addressing harms in community that has a, a restorative quality to it that I certainly know many of our neighbors appreciate. So I'm excited about more options there as well. And I know for all three of us, everything we have spoken to is just the tip of the iceberg of all the issues we'll talk about tonight. So I'm really excited to dig into questions and chat with you, our neighbors. Thank you all for those opening remarks. Um, a couple accessibility items that I forgot to mention at the start of this event, so my apologies. Uh, live, transcript, live transcription is enabled, so you can click that option at the bottom of your Zoom screen if you would like to use it. 
Um, additionally, if you need Mandarin interpretation, there is a little globe icon on the bottom far right, and you can click that to select the option for Chinese interpretation for this event. And with that, uh, we are going to go ahead and get right into questions. So we have one that was submitted right here on Zoom. Um, and this question for all three of our lawmakers says, why did the ranked choice voting bill fail this session and how will all three of you make sure it passes next session? Well, I'm happy to start that one, if that's all right, Representative Santos. I was going to suggest that you do that since it's your bill. <laughs> Thank you, that's so kind. Um, I was really honored to be asked by community to steward this policy the last two years. I do want to note that I am from a long line of folks who have been stewarding this policy well before I had the opportunity to serve in this capacity. And we took this bill further than it had ever been previously. We had again this year, the opportunity to have discussions in caucus about the bill. Um, certainly I know folks are aware that we are having this conversation in Washington state when voting rights again is at the top of mind as we consider all sorts of um, continued erosions on our democracy happening in other parts of the country. So it feels again, like a very important topic for this year. Regretfully with the short session um, and despite doing a lot of great bipartisan work on this bill, which was a wonderful thing to see that we could have support from both sides of the aisle for ranked choice voting, which would change to proportional ways of voting um, so that we could have more community voice in our vote outcomes. But with the short session, we just were not able to get it to the floor for what would have been no doubt still a pretty lengthy debate um, around the details of the bill. So we do not lose momentum. We will keep working through interim. And I do want to acknowledge the work with community with the previous interim. We met with county auditors who are the stewards of the health of our voting systems all over the state over interim, really got to have deep discussions and had built a lot of considerations for implementation into the version of the bill that the substitute that was introduced this year. So this is a very strong bill, a lot of community buy-in, a lot of community work. So I feel very promising about its prospects in the next year. I, if you don't mind, so I will go next and simply say um, again, uh, this, uh, work that uh, Representative Kirsten harris Talley has been leading has been very, very important, and it has expanded the conversation. Uh, I will also say very clearly um, that I am not supportive of ranked choice voting um, because I still need to be um, uh, convinced about the fail safes. And I know that Representative Harris Talley has been working tirelessly on this. So it's not about that. It is about the fact that we have so many people uh, in our democracy that um, may not uh, fully understand and appreciate how ranked choice voting uh, takes place. You may have others because we do know that um, quote unquote gaming of the uh, voting systems um, happens all over the place. People will try to do that in a variety of ways. And so uh, the concern that I've raised with the advocates is a philosophical one. Uh, first and foremost, the question of my strong belief in one person, one vote. And if uh, the three members of the 37th legislative uh, delegation uh, for example, were each uh, voters and we had a choice between uh, five different electors and Representative Harris Talley ranked her five and Senator Saldana uh, ranked three of the five and I only chose one. I'm not understanding how that meets the one person, one vote. And I also don't understand yet how that doesn't dilute uh, the person uh, who either has the most number of uh, choices or the one who only chooses one. And so um, I'm looking forward to the continuation of uh, the evolution of this policy and continuing to be able to have these conversations uh, both with my seatmate as well as with community. Yeah, and I, I mean, so this is great. 
Um, the Senate version um, was always going to be the House vehicle this year, but we're very excited to have um, a Senate bill this year to make sure that we are educating and answering these questions and wrestling with them. Um, and we'll stay committed and partnering um, because I think we are making huge gains. Representative Harris Talley has moved this further along than it has ever moved. And it is the hard work of, of talking with auditors, of working it out so that people can get over any kind of concerns they have. Um, and just want to take advantage of this moment of talking about Washington, about Voting Rights Act, uh, voting rights um, and access to democracy to um, say that it is really important to what Representative Harris Talley spoke to of what's happening at the federal level is that we cannot um, wait for violations to happen um, and that we have a Washington State Voting Rights Act that uh, is possible because of um, the, the Democrats taking the majority in the Senate where we were able to um, put forward that in 2018. And there is a Senate bill in the House right now, um, 5597 to strengthen the Washington Voting Rights Act. Um, so that regardless of what's happening in the other Washington, um, that we have um, the strongest protections for making sure that um, people can vote and elect people that ha share their interests. Um, and this is really important um, as we are seeing redistricting um, not be as transparent as it can be, as we're seeing um, you know, legislation getting to the federal uh, level and, and particularly Libby versus Holder a couple of years ago, which took away um, the strong teeth of protecting people's rights by making sure that if there was a violation or there's a certain um, threshold of uh, minority um, folks in a, a jurisdiction, that that jurisdiction has to get pre-clearance. They have to make sure that what they're proposing for changing the way that elections happen does not for, you know, does not impact um, that minority population and that the people have a real chance to be able to get elected. So definitely want um, and hope that we can work through those questions and um, keep moving that piece of legislation forward. Thank you. Great. For folks who just joined us, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom to ask a question. We are also answering questions submitted uh, when you registered for this event. So we are moving on to a question submitted in advance. This one comes from Aaron, who asks, as the biggest threat to our future, how are you prioritizing addressing climate change and advancing environmental justice? Which bills have the best prospect of becoming law addressing renewable and sustainable energy initiatives? Well, well Go for it. I'm, I'm happy to speak to a couple different policies um, that we moved on the House side and considerations. Um, I wanna say that also our transpo budget is shaped a lot by this conversation. So I know Senator Saldana will have a lot of context to add there um, as we looked at a transportation plan that is wholly transformed because of some considerations of policy in this space. The biggest considerations for policy this year are deepening Washington State's commitment around electrification. And I wanna name that for neighbors in the 37th, that also means affordability, it's particularly when we're talking about new housing infrastructure, uh, refurbishing housing infrastructure that we currently have mm -hmm. and thinking through all of the conduits to what it is to live here, whether it be transit or other things. So these conversations about what these investments look like, but also who are going to be the beneficiaries of those investments, this year we really deepened those conversations. So a lot of policy that is about where we're doing investments, where we're doing grants, what is and is not allowed by corporations in this space and how we're gonna keep community investment at the forefront. Um, I'll pass it on to Senator Saldana. Yeah, and I mean, I am focusing a lot as Representative Harris Talley spoke to the budget. So how we're making those investments um, one piece is um, air quality in Beacon Hill. So, um, and in South Park um, area and really throughout the 37th. So a big piece was trying to push for a proviso for um, getting more funding in um, for air quality monitors that allow us to look at it holistically, but at the local level as well. So we can really think about what are the interventions and source points of, of that pollution. I think in the budget of the, the transportation 
proposals going forward, I think it's important to look at some of the policy that we're embedding into um, the transportation budget. A lot of the programming will be under the HEAL Act. And so for grant programs and for investments over time, looking at uh, making sure that those are being targeted uh, to communities that have been historically disproportionately impacted by um, the, the poor air quality that um, we have. And um, also making sure that over time, because I know I've seen a couple of questions as well about um, our transportation investment is radically different. There are still um, roads that need to be paved and preserved. There are still um, projects um, that we have to complete that we already made commitments to. And, um, it, but uh, because of advocacy of front and centered of environmental organizations, Transportation Choices Coalition, a couple of years ago, we got a proviso in to make sure that transportation um, overall should look at our goals of safety and preservation and maintenance and, and measure our, how much is are these projects actually improving the overall system. And um, we created it a, a a tool basically that begins to uh, overlay a lens of equity and health um, around those transportation goals. And um, the, the bill before us will um, further that work so that as we move along, more projects will have to go through that um, analysis uh, and be able to give us that information um, so that we as legislators can ideally then do a better job of making sure that um, we aren't just choosing projects, we are choosing projects that are overall creating improvement of mobility and safety um, and equity throughout the state of Washington, um, regardless of whether you roll or walk um, or um, take a, a, an individual um, vehicle to get where you need to go. Rep Santos, you are on mute. I just realized that. Um, what I wanted to add is uh, what the investments we're making uh, in the capital budget um, in, in this uh, sort of arena. And I'd say that they, they fall into about three different buckets. One is around how do we promote clean energy that's locally sourced? So we have um, put money towards uh, two clean energy projects. One is up in Whatcom County uh, where we're restarting an aluminum smelter, but we're really going to make sure that it's actually going to be uh, clean energy uh, that's both used as well uh, in terms of what uh, the, the uh, production of the uh, aluminum. Uh, and also in Eastern Washington, a solar manufacturing facility, we're also making uh, an important investment of about seven and a half million dollars to the University of Washington's Clean Energy Institute. Um, more on the um, uh, sort of the building side of things, uh, we are uh, putting about uh, $2 million of federal dollars into the Energy Efficiency Revolving Loan Fund uh, to help provide loans and grants for en energy efficiency audits and upgrades and retrofits um, so that uh, our buildings can be more energy efficient and still and, and be comfortable. And the one that I'm really excited about because one of the first jobs I ever had was uh, working for the Central Area Motivation Program uh, camp in the um, Central District. Uh, and the program, um, I wasn't assigned to this program, but one of the feature programs that uh, camp offered was the low income uh, weatherization program. And so, uh, and that was to help both renters and homeowners uh, weatherize um, their homes. And so we've put $30 million into the weatherization plus health program so that we can um, help provide the necessary uh, funding for many uh, low income persons to also um, create energy efficient homes. Thank you folks for all these wonderful questions. Oh, I'm sorry, Rep Harris Talley, I saw you unmuted. Uh, yes, Emily, and, and I appreciate everything my colleagues shared and just wanted to note that one of the things that's transformational when we think about these particular investments is we've had a lot of dependency on fossil fuel generated revenue, 
like the gas tax and other considerations, you will see that this year we have a new vision for what are the dollars sustaining these investments, which is also a change in the lens of how we think about this comprehensively. So it, we have to pay attention. And I think we ha are starting to see that more and more, not only where the dollars are coming from, but where they're going. So to have both ends of those equation with a clear sense of our planet and our people and our economy being able to all be healthy is a big transformation that I'm very excited for neighbors to see. All right, we have a question from Zoom. This one comes from Jim and Jim asked, what have the three of you sponsored to bring economic justice to our community for black and brown people? So um, one of the things that I'm going to uh, say is because it's an unusual place for me and I'm trying to decide if I uh, am going to do this again. This is the very first year in 24 years I've not sponsored as a prime sponsor a single piece of legislation. Um, I have found that it has both given me more time to work on a lot of other pieces of legislation and to go more deeply. So there's an advantage to that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the direct answer to your question is this year, nothing. But that's not to say I have not been working on these issues. So as an example, um, one of the uh, bills that I'm very excited about, uh, excuse me, not bills. Um, well, I am excited about the bill. It's the House Supplemental Operating Budget. So I'm very excited about that bill. Uh, but in the House Supplemental Operating Budget, um, I have some funding uh, in there for what is called the MLK Gandhi Empowerment Initiative. And this uh, project um, is going to take um, under and unemployed individuals who are, for, they're going to target first um, members of the African-American community and they will be enrolled as participants uh, in a, I think it's a 20 week, maybe it's 12 week, there's a two in there, uh, program uh, to learn um, different types of uh, computer programs. And I don't know the names of them all. I think one's called Azure and one's called who knows what else. I'm not a techie, uh, but these are going to be high demand uh, programs. They will have one-on-one -on -one mentors with uh, people who are already in the tech industry. And um, the funding that we will be providing in the operating budget is to provide those individuals with a living stipend of, uh, I think it's um, $2,500 per month for the period of time that they're going through the training. Those jobs start at about, depending on which company and what program you're learn, learning, anywhere from 85,000 on up per year. And they would be able to get into those right away. That is one example of uh, the work that I'm doing um, to invest back into our um uh, communities of color and particularly the economic recovery and rebuilding of our communities. All right, we're moving on to a question submitted in advance on our survey. This one is from Joseph. And this question is, how will you fight for unemployment insurance for undocumented workers in the next session? How is the supplemental, I think this is supplemental budget supporting immigrant communities? Sorry, it just can, is that the undocumented worker relief? So I, I can start this one. So, I mean, last year, our, our, this we worked hard with the community to make sure that we had Undoc the, the worker relief fund, um, the community, this was a coalition, a statewide coalition of immigrant and refugees and huge solidarity with many neighbors and are the 37th to push for that. And we, and what was really important for us is that we also got a proviso to look at how do we create and stand up 
an a relief fund, un unemployment insurance program for individuals um, that um, are falling through the cracks of our main unemployment insurance program. That piece of legislation um, became, you know, got a striker this year. We had a hearing in the Senate um, and um, out of that proviso came really good recommendations that, you know, I think we're, we have helped structure. Um, but, and, and I feel really frustrated that I was not able to get it further along this session, but I do, um, I have made a commitment and anyone here that wants to join us um, of working to make sure that we answer, that we address the issues of main, uh, how we sustain the revenue um, and also how we make sure that our, our current unemployment insurance program works better for more workers as well, um, because our staff, and I just, if you have called and worked with our, our teams, we each have one, um, one a legislative assistant um, that works with us, but we had unprecedented um, claims and concerns and, and frustrations with unemployment insurance, being able to access it. Um, and, and so I think that has been a big part of this last two years too, is making sure that our current unemployment insurance program um, works better, is more humane, has the resources and the capacity to scale up when we have a crisis and a pandemic like we do, like we have had. Um, so this interim, I'm going to continue to work on that. And that's going to be a big part of my work is to make sure that we can bring back that legislation and get it further along um, next session. The other piece I just want to say in this space if is that because of the past work that we did, um, we had starting January 1st, 2021, um, paid family medical leave. Mm -hmm. And so there is legislation this year to make sure that um, it was oversubscribed. Uh, more people were able to take advantage of that um, than we had initially anticipated. So we're making sure that with this operating budget that we um, backfill and make sure that it stays strong and is accessible to people regardless of their status, every Washingtonian that um, meets certain qualifications doesn't um, are able to access that program. Um, and we are hoping to make it stronger um, for families um, to be able to continue to access that. I think I would just add a couple of things and I'm going to hop around a little bit in the different ways that we uh, are supporting our immigrant and refugee population. Again, um, we may not have the highest in the state, but we have a darn, again, it's because of our diversity, we have a very high population of individuals who were not born in this country. Um, so one very important thing I'm very proud to announce in the House operating supplemental budget is uh, an investment of $30 million for immigrant and refugee support. Um, similarly, um, uh, the uh, Senator referenced the paid family leave. Um, the other thing that we did a couple of years ago and we are expanding this year is the working families tax credit. And what we did in Washington state was to make sure that we were able to create a way for um, uh, persons who do not have a social security number to still benefit from uh, that tax credit. There are two other things that I will mention uh, because it may not come immediately to mind, uh, but um, we are creating uh, an unusual program um, from the states. So for example, we many of us are familiar with the federal student loan program. Well, Washington is going to embark on creating our own student loan program. And what the benefit to that is, is just as we created a WAFSA, a Washington student financial aid form um, so that we could still provide uh, uh, tuition subsidies um, and uh, scholarships to undocumented students, we will now also be able to extend the type of credit we're uh, giving to undocumented persons with our state-only run 
uh, student loan program. And then finally, I would say um, for many of our uh, immigrant and refugee, not all, but many of our immigrant and refugee uh, families, particularly those who are uh, more recent arrivals to the United States. Um, the issue of food security uh, becomes quite acute. And so one of the things that we are doing is to make sure that every student in our um, uh, elementary and secondary uh, schools, uh, when they attend a high poverty school, every child in the school building will get fed, no matter what, they will get fed breakfast and they will get fed lunch. And those are just a couple of ways beyond just direct grants that we try to support immigrant and refugees. Thank you so much for all these great questions, folks. We are gonna answer a question from Zoom. This question is from Emija. Um, and it says, race and politics continue to, to determine what legislation moves forward in the legislative process. How are you specifically pushing for legislation addressing the harm endured by 37th district by crime bills? Or how are you specifically pushing and voting for legislation that addresses the harm endured by 37th district residents who are affected by crime bills and over-policing that causes disproportionate incarceration to Black, Indigenous, and people of color? Such an important question, and I thank you for raising it. Uh, as folks know, in 2020, neighbors all over Seattle, but particularly in the 37th, took to the streets and sustained protest for police accountability because of the way for generations, black, brown, indigenous, and poor people have been disproportionately impacted by police presence uh, and police observation and police violence. So the reason that this is so important is because those marches in the streets in 2020, where George Floyd's death amplified what we've known to be the case, led to a lot of landmark legislation in 2021. We are a state that passed the largest amount of police accountability bills simultaneously of any state. Um, and we still lead in considerations of accountability. And this year through interim of last year and this year, we also had some refinements to those policies. We've had several votes that were taken on the House and Senator Soldani can speak to the votes in the Senate as well. Uh, one of those considerations was around Bill 1310, which oriented around police use of force. And we had three different bills that surfaced in the House for discussion there. One was around considerations of behavioral health needs and when folks need officers to arrive to help folks in mental health crisis. That was very well worked with community and many frontline workers who work with our neighbors and loved ones who have behavioral health needs to shape a policy that we could have that very narrowly gave what law enforcement and other first responders need to be responsive in those situations. That passed out of the house and I was able to vote yes on that. We also had another consideration for another bill we passed that made militarized equipment for police no longer legal in Washington state with a very narrow consideration, again, worked with community for consideration of, of an exemption there for those weapons that are used for non-lethal, such as bean bags for disbursement of large crowds, that sort of thing, which also came to the house floor. I was able to vote yes for that. Um, but last Saturday, uh, one of the policies oriented around use of force that was actually changing the consideration of standard for use of force 2037, there was a lot of debate on the floor and there was mixed reception even amongst Democrats for voting for that policy. I was one of some dissenting votes on that. It is the one place where um, I voted no in consideration of these policies. For me and some, the consideration of use and forth with that particular policy opened up those moments where, that I actually um, got to give a speech on the floor with consideration of those moments when use of force extends into um, deadly force. And we know we've lost a lot of loved ones, particularly in the 37th when that happens. So this is a 
conversation that's going to continue as we continue to have these policies picked up at the local level and continued local conversations. I do want to note that for our neighbors here in Seattle, it is very important this conversation about what policies we're going to pass at the state level, because at the local level, we will be in negotiations over police contracts this year. Um, and so this conversation is extraordinarily salient for us also because we're in a city that is now in its 13th, going on 14th year in a consent decree from the federal level because of what over policing and violence in our communities has looked like. So I implore all advocates continue to talk to me and all of my colleagues about this issue because it is such an important one, particularly in this moment. Yeah, and I'll just say, um... There's good house bills coming over that I'm very excited for, um, supporting uh, 1412, um, 1169. And you know we sent a couple over. Um, one is a Senator Jingra bill and with NAACP to, you know, we don't have parole, we should. Um, this um, begin, that, that piece of legislation begins to try to make it less um, about politics and more about letting people have a fair shake once they've been in to get out. Um, I also was really proud to introduce a piece of legislation that I hope uh, that got all got good um, um, got out of policy committee. Got um, good, had a good hearing in Ways and Means. We just need to um, build up next year um, the funding um, for it, which is fifty seven seventy two. Um, to give counsel to folks post conviction and uh, to make sure that again, that people have been locked up. We know the policy is bad. We've reversed policies and yet we don't go back and make sure that everyone gets that fair shake to actually um, have it apply retroactively and in a way that they can actually access it. So that will continue to be um, a body of work I look forward to working on. Um, I did want to also in this moment recognize that there was a bad piece of legislation that needs to be addressed that was sent off of the Senate floor. I definitely voted no. I spoke up against it. And um, that was Senate Bill 5919 um, that I think rolls things back. We had huge progress last year because of the uprisings, because of the organizing. Um, that um, black lives are supposed to matter. And yet um, when it makes legislators uncomfortable, when it makes, um, you know, it, and it, it, it is a challenge for us and we are lucky and honored to serve the 37th where we can be clear where we need to go and we need to keep on pushing. But um, I just want to make sure people know about that because um, I would like it to get slowed down and um, and hope that um, that will happen. Um, so I think that last thing too is um, I might is Representative Morgan's um, legislation that was governor request that came from I see people here um, that advocated and have been fighting for equity in cannabis. And that um, part of the legislation, that, that piece of legislation creates the Community Reinvestment Act. And at least in the first year, it will, in, it will invest in programs that are um, funding um, the right kind of um, uh, re-entry and trying to, to keep kids out of the, the prison pipeline um, with the Office of Fire and Arms and Safety Community Grants that fund groups like 180 and Community Passageways in, that are doing amazing work in our district, uh, as well as um, investing in financial um, CDFIs and CDCs to make sure that, um, you know, our communities tend to continue to have fight, fight racism within the financial institutions. So making sure that we're creating um, pathways and opportunities to invest in um, um, community, small business owners, entrepreneurs um, through um, those grant programs. And we know that that's not enough, it needs to grow. Um, but um, it is something that is um, one I just want to highlight because that would not have happened without the advocacy that's rooted in the 37th pushing um, and to make us go faster. And I know we're still not going fast enough, but I do want to acknowledge um, that is a win that community um, has helped get um, and I, yeah, and I think the last thing I just want to say in this space, because I don't know when we'll get another chance, is that um, 
I think it is where we're investing in our capital dollars. I think the three of us have really tried to build over the last two years, um, making sure one way for me to see that our communities are, are getting out of this pipeline is making sure our communities can control development and that more Black, Indigenous, and people of color, immigrants, are taking ownership and shaping development. So I'm really excited that the Harriet Tubman Center got funded at the level that they asked. Um, you know, still fighting for more money for Youth Achievement Center, but also for Skyway with affordable housing um, project um, that we were able to get in this cycle. And I know that we haven't even compared notes yet between our two operating budgets, but I'm really excited about the kinds of um, wins we're able to try to make um, happen because we know when money gets into communities' hands, that you're going to do a good job of making sure um, that um, we're trying to undo some of that harm. Thank you. All right, let's talk about housing. We have a question from Cheryl. Cheryl said, I am born and raised in Seattle, 62 years and can't find an affordable house in the city where I was raised. I'm being forced to buy outside of Seattle. What is being done about affordable housing and business ownership? Sorry, I keep wanting to talk with, with my mic turned off. So uh, that is one area that um, uh, I wanna talk about capital investments. Um, and I, but capital investments are not the only answer. They are a big part of the answer, uh, but it's not the only answer. Um, in the capital budget, uh, I think it's important that we recognize that we could not have made historic investments in things like housing, uh, in things like the uh, you know, clean energy and um, um, weatherization and other important capital um, uh, appropriations, except for the fact that the operating budget transferred $737 million to the capital budget. That's pretty important for me to underscore. The, there, is a, there is a direct interrelationship between all of these budgets. The operating budget also in the House, uh, I don't know what they did in the Senate, but the House uh, transferred $2 billion to the transportation budget. What that means is $2.8 billion were not available for other operating needs, but those are the kinds of trade-offs uh, that uh, we had to make. Um, one of the reasons that $737 million of the operating budget was transferred to the capital budget was specifically to invest in affordable housing. Uh, there was uh, 300 million for rapid acquisition of housing and shelter facilities. There was a new $100 million uh, uh, appropriated for permanent supportive housing, which meant that you wrap around the health services around housing for people who need both. We included $100 million for the Housing Trust Fund, which does include a small amount, $12.5 million, for home ownership projects, and uh, $100 million for other community-based behavioral health facilities, and $15 million for homeless youth facilities. That's where the operating dollars went to ensure that we start investing in housing. There are other bills uh, that I think are still being worked on one way or another to address some of the uh, housing policy issues, some of which I know uh, represented a great disappointment to many people. Uh, but I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and Representative Harris Talley can help uh, correct my memory, uh, but we did get the um, 
ADU bill off the House floor. So that's one way that we are able to help build greater density uh, in our communities. Um, and hopefully that will help um, adjust. And one of the intentions around ADUs is to provide space for uh, those of us whose needs may start to be shrinking as we get older. Uh, we still want our own space to call our own, but maybe we don't need to have, not that I've ever seen in the 37th district, but we used to call them the muck mansions. Uh, I don't think there are many of those in the 37th district, uh, but we are starting to see things that are much more higher end and ADUs are not intended to be that. Yes, we passed out of the House, House Bill 1660, which was championed by Representative Schumick. And this is one of the um, first ADU bills I've had the chance to vote off the floor. This has been somewhat contentious at the state level, despite it being a solution in our district for quite a while. And of course, um, the thing I'm really excited about this particular policy is that it looks at these accessory dwelling units and actually gives option for ownership of those units. So that's a really transformational option for what it is to have both the space, as Representative Santos noted, that accessory dwelling units offer, um, but to move beyond just that being an option for renting, but also ownership changes the conversation. I do wanna note that one bill that did not make it over the finish line that I know is, is at the intersection of a lot of solutions that neighbors champion was 1782 by Representative Bateman that was looking at the intersection of where transit infrastructure is, affordability and density. And those are the kind of intersectional solutions that certainly neighbors in the 37th have had conversations with me and no doubt my colleagues about because we know that for folks to be here and stay here, as you noted, it's it's disheartening to hear after six decades that you could be leaving our community, not because you want to, but because you simply can't find a place to stay. And that's something we need to end because currently in Washington state, we have a quarter million dollar units behind in what we need to actually have affordability. I also want to note that we just had a bill come over from the Senate, from Senator Nguyen, looking at tiny house options for our houseless neighbors as well. And we cannot talk about affordability without also talking about getting a roof over the head of our neighbors who find themselves so deeply displaced that they find themselves trying to survive on our streets. And that has to end as well. Yeah, and I'll just add again, this is a place where capital budget is important. Um, I mean, one of the projects that we have in the Senate um, capital budget is a property that um, um, Reverend Jeffries um, and um, Lehigh purchased. It was a private rental um, that um, they were going to hike up everyone's rents and people were facing eviction. And we are hopefully they, they have secured and purchased that property and um, keeping those rents affordable is a critical piece of that. Um, I think the other there's a bill that we that we sent over from the Senate. I think we need to look at it more carefully. But I think the idea is as um, there are more apartment buildings going up is the idea of um, the possibility of converting some of them to home ownership opportunities. Um, I know that this was an idea that um, you know we are looking at how do we create whether it's ADUs giving more people more opportunities for housing to be built in a variety of housing so that um, people can age in place. Um, and so I think that's another piece that, um, of course, we want them to be good and quality and make sure that there's consumer protections around that. But I do think that is a place where um, we have to look at in terms of making sure that there's affordability and opportunities for home ownership in our district. We are running out of time tonight, unfortunately. That will have to be our last question. And I'm going to turn it back over to our lawmakers for some really brief closing remarks to wrap up our night. So Senator Saldana, can you kick us off with those, please? Yes, I just wanna thank um, the interpreters and thank all those who have joined us today. Um, it is, uh, your advocacy is important 
And um, I look forward to um, working with you to make sure that we get as much as we can done this short session, but really um, looking forward to um, being back in, in district and working so that we are ready next year when we have the big budget again as well. Um, so please keep on um, reaching out to us and um, I look forward to um, hearing from you again soon. Uh, I also join in thanking uh, everyone who made time uh, to join us for this town hall. I uh, also want to thank uh, my colleagues, Senator Saldana and a representative Harris Talley. Uh, we are, um, as the first, we are historic as being the first all women of color delegation in the history of the Washington State Legislature. Um, I think that that is, says a lot about our district. Um, the uh, last thing I will say is you heard me talk about recovery and rebuilding. Um, the, the last uh, notion that I want to um, focus in on during the interim uh, and into the 2023-2025 uh, biennium is the notion of renewal and resurgence. Um, and so I hope that all of you uh, will continue to stay safe, safe and healthy uh, for the remainder of this year so that we can tackle 2023-2025 uh, with uh, renewed uh, vigor and um, I will pass it to my CA. Thank you all so much, our neighbors, for taking this time with us. We know you've had a long day already doing what you do with and for community, and it's just such a pleasure to have uh, this time with you all to hear your questions and, and be in response and service to you. I also want to thank my colleagues and let folks know, even though it's a short session, there's still plenty of time to have your voice heard. All of our committees continue to meet via Zoom, which means you can join and make sure we hear your needs and, and those of your neighbors from the comfort of your home and safety of your home. And so please keep contacting us, reach out. We will continue to make sure that justice, equity, and action are centered in our deliberations as we get to the end of session on March 10th. And I just want to also say in this month of February, happy Black History Month. And to all who continue to champion racial equity, um, the legacies that you have bolster us in this work. So thank you. Thank you once again to our lawmakers and to all of you for joining us. We had a lot of really wonderful questions tonight and we did not get to anywhere near enough for answering all of them. So if you have a question that went unanswered, please feel free to reach out to your lawmakers offices and they will get back to you to the best of their ability. And with that, thank you so much for joining us folks and have a wonderful evening.